watch this later. Hello, everyone. My name is Dr. Pam Kastner. I have the honor of serving as the um, president of the Reading League Pennsylvania. Um, and joined this evening by our vice president, Don Brookhart, and our secretary, Erin Amy. And we are thrilled that you will join us again for our monthly series, the PA Proud Showcase, where we honor and highlight amazing school districts and organizations that are aligning themselves with the science of reading and willing to share their journey with all of you. Tonight, I have the honor of introducing the Indiana Area School District and their superintendent, Mike Vukovic. Um, I have known Mike, oh my gosh, Mike, I don't know how many years we've known each other, but you will not find a more dedicated, passionate, um, outstanding superintendent in Pennsylvania than Mike Vukovic. He has the leader that we all wish we had in our school districts, and he is completely committed to the science of reading and supporting this amazing team that's going to share their journey uh, with you. And I'm going to allow Mike to introduce the team to all of you this evening. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Pam. Uh, we're honored to be here tonight, and thank you for the kind words. I have to say, though, I'm blessed to know Pam uh, for over a decade, and she really helped me, uh, and she still helps me grow a lot in this area. I have a lot to learn, and I'm blessed to be surrounded by good people and a good team. That's really, I think, what really makes the change uh, that much more palpable and allows us to get through it. But uh, thank you so much, Pam, for the kind words, and thank you for your friendship over the decade plus of years. Um, I am honored to be here tonight with an incredible group of ladies. They are some of the best in the business, and they help me every single day get better. And more importantly, they help our kids get better. On the call with us tonight is Dr. Angela McMasters, uh, Ms. Shelley Wright. They are part of our MTSS uh, and school psychologist team. And then we have a principal who I think is second to none, one of the best in the Commonwealth, in Ms. Kelly Urbani. And they have really done <clears throat> a great job really leading us into the new uh, this new vision that we have for the district. And I, I, I'm appreciative I have a small part tonight, but really all the credit is due to these wonderful women. So again, thank you um, for the opportunity to give our, our, our story, tell a little bit about our vision, our background, but more importantly, our why uh, behind our efforts. We have done a great deal of work and we're honored to be here tonight, but we have a lot more work to do. Uh, and the one thing I, you know, they, a lot of people make fun of me for it is a saying I use all the time as we talk about our journey and anything related to education. And uh, I usually, I use this all the time. Uh, and there's two things that people hate, uh, change and the way things are. And as we started to make this change in our, our, our drive here in education and in the science of, liter uh, science of literacy, science of reading, we really had to confront that head on. So Kelly, if you could hit the next slide for me, I appreciate it. Kelly, are you able to move the next slide? I'm sorry. There we go. So let me tell you a little bit about us, uh, a little bit about the district. We are located in Western Pennsylvania. We have about 2,800 students in our district and we have about 47 to 50% of our kids qualifying for free and reduced lunch status. Now that may not seem like a lot, but fast forward, uh, rewind uh, about a decade, decade and a half ago, uh, we are less than 10% free and reduced. So what you've seen over the last 10 years is the system really changed dramatically and we, as a new administration coming in four years ago, had to real, had really have real conversations about what do we really need to do to adapt to meet the moment, adapt to meet the needs of our students. And that's where I really partnered with Pam and brought her in um, during my time at Johnstown. I got to know her, so I brought her in and said, look, let's talk about literacy. What can we do differently? And what's missing? As we see our demographics change, the system really didn't adapt to meet the moment. So what can we do differently uh, to really go out there and provide you know, some quality supports and interventions? for students. Uh, I got to the district in 2018. Prior to that, in 2016, they adopted benchmark literacy. And we only had 50% of students at or above benchmark. So you talk about a real big change to the system. We really shocked the system within two years coming in and really some making some real comprehensive changes. And there's a lot of things I learned from that, that change in that move. But really for me, the answer or the question I had to really answer was, when is a good time to make the change, right? You know, because I, I tried to involve people, I tried to involve our experts and tried to involve our friends, but what we've really found were kids were hurting and we were losing kids. So I had to make the change and I had to take that leap of faith and I had to take that and, and confront it head on. And again, as I said earlier, there's two things that people hate, change in the way things are. So we really, really had to confront that, that, that type of mindset. And that was important. So Kelly, if you can move on next slide. So I wanna talk a little bit about our why. Um, I challenge Kelly and all of our principals and our school psychs, and you can ask them, to test us, I teach, my philosophy of leadership is we have two main goals as an administration, um, to provide hope and opportunity for all students and for our community and to our families. And if we're serious about equity, 
then I think it starts with the conversation on literacy. I think that's one of the biggest um, equity conversation pieces that we need to have if we're truly going to be serious about equity. And we also want to talk about as a team, as a group, look, reading is not only a fundamental educational right and educational issue, it's also an economic issue. And how do we confront that and really go out there and give our kids the skills they need? Because what we found is our demographics changed, so did the amount of needs that our kids had. And we really wanted to confront that uh, and proceed on the basis of facts and not emotions. And I don't say that to be flippant or dismissive of people's opinions, thoughts, or emotions, because they put a lot of work into what they've done. But we also really had to be, talk, be clear about the work and be clear about the research and be clear about what the data was telling us and what we needed to do. And one quote we used all the time, not to hurt anyone or hurt ourselves, but to kind of put our pulse back on the idea of you know, staying true to our vision is the greatest enemy of knowledge is not ignorance, it's the illusion of knowledge. And we really came in when we made this switch, we really changed a lot of people's thought processes and challenged their beliefs about what they thought um, excellent teaching, uh, excellent instruction in the area of literacy was. And we really had to confront that. And the thing we kept telling ourselves over and over, if we don't spend time preparing students and doing this the right way, we're gonna spend a lot more time preparing students. And not only the way of academics, but there's a cost associated with that. So we really wanted to confront that, that new normal and that, that new reality that we were facing. And, then, and it was difficult and it was challenging, but it was a worthy uh, conversation. And Kelly, if you can go to the next slide. And I think if I could sum it up, uh, for me, there's often way too much conversation about the achievement gap in education. And I'm not trying to mitigate it or ignore it because I think it's real and I think it's something worth talking about. But I think before you talk about the achievement gap, we have to really look at the, the opportunity gaps that exist in our organizations. And then besides that, uh, looking at uh, the opportunity gaps that exist in our organizations, we also need to talk about the gaps that exist between research and practice. So when we made this shift, we really just wanted to look at what the research said, what the research told us, what evidence-based practices look like, and how do we commit to that? And we're still in a process and we're still going through that journey. But if you ask me in my, in my closing comments, why is this important? If you look at it from a 12th grader's perspective and someone who's going to about to graduate and go into the real world, I get it and I understand graduates who lack basic skills may be unemployable and represent personal and society tragedy tragedy, but what happens about the graduates who possess basic skills, but is partially informed, can partially read, unable to think, incapable of making moral choices, those people are downright dangerous. So before we can make great employees and employable uh, workers, we have to first make better people. And that's exactly what we're doing by putting literacy at the heart of what we're doing. It's our call to, um, to equity. It's one of the the, the goalposts per se, if you'd like, about how we're really going to advance this district moving forward. Because a lot of time you hear people talk about all means all. Well, if they do, then really let's make a system that is encompassing of all, that is designed to meet the needs of each unique individual that really exists in our organization. Um, but people, you know, just aren't made like that. We have to develop and grow our students. It's incumbent upon us to grow them uh, in our school, in our community. And that's exactly what you're going to hear tonight. And I'll turn it over to our three amazing ladies, but I, I promise you this. Uh, yes, we have a lot to go, but we're further than we've ever been. And we have three amazing ladies who really led us through all this. And, and Pam, in my last comments, I can't thank you enough for your friendship over the last decade and plus and how you helped us grow as a district. Uh, we couldn't have done this alone. And we, yes, we have star, still a long, long way to go, but uh, you're a big part of getting us at least where we are today. And I, and I can't thank you enough for your friendship and your support over the years. So with that said, uh, I have three amazing ladies. I'll turn over to Dr. McMaster's and she'll coordinate from here. And uh, uh, thank you for your time. And I'm humbled that you can hear me out this evening. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mike. So we thought what we would kind of do this evening is highlight the systemic changes that we've made and what that journey has been for us, because I think there's so much and sometimes it's kind of like, where do I start? And so there are many days that I think we'd all agree. We feel like the, the lady on the right with the post-it notes everywhere. I actually do have a string of post-it notes in my office with all the things. And I mentioned to our director of ed, I'm like, you know, I just took a whole bunch of those post-its down because we've accomplished them and I threw them away. And I'm like, why did I do that? So I just felt like as our team built this presentation for you, it was like, what were the things that we've learned on this journey because it's one thing to have the tools and it's another thing to start looking at this gargantuan task of eating the elephant and sometimes i think our elephant regenerates and we've taken a bite and then turn around and it's grown back um we also joke that it's the twilight zone because it's like oh my gosh we thought i thought we tackled this so um <clears throat> just for anyone out there building their system that is your good cow you can stay here um that's kind of where we're at with the elephant so we talk about that all the time. 
Um, also, we know that our goal is to build a system that fits the students. We don't want the students to have to fit the system. And that's been a large part of our focus is what do we need to do systemically with our practices to make sure that students are making the growth that Mr. Vukovic talked about. So um, just wanted to quickly highlight our journey at Indiana Area School District. So as Mr. Vukovic pointed out in 2018, that's whenever there started to be some conversations and a call for change. We, um, I wasn't actually in the district at that time, but they had adopted benchmark literacy. Um, and that was what was in place when I started working in Indiana in 2019, 2020. And so at that point, it was there were several decisions made in the 1819 school year. And then I was brought on board with some of my colleagues um, in 1920, where we were like, okay, we are doing data meetings, we're starting when you want to talk about eating the elephant, it was like, it felt like we were like gulping it all at one time. And we really had to step back and kind of slow down and go slow to go fast. And then we didn't even get to finish that year. And the pandemic hit. Um, and so that has been a bit of a challenge for us as a team leading this charge. And I put on there just keep swimming for last school year because we went from being, you know, full capacity, all of our reading specialists, structure our wind time structured. And then our reading specialists became our synchronous teachers for students who were online. So our teachers were doing as best as they could to keep swimming and kind of keep us with that momentum that we started out so strongly with the first year of implementation. So it's been really cool for our team to enter this school year at full capacity with all of our reading specialists and great partnerships with our local university, IUP. And we have graduate assistants from the education department. We have clinics that come in from the speech and language department, and we have school psychologist interns. So we really have tried to tap into our university resources as well. And so the excitement I think is so real for our whole team because it's like, we can do this. Like we can do this in spite of a pandemic, in spite of not having kids in front of us. Um, some days when we just feel like we're surviving, we can do this. And so we have our going forward hope and opportunity to be continued because there's so much that we're going to continue to grow. Um, Kelly and Shelly, please feel free to jump in if I've missed anything. Um, we, does anyone, I can't see my people now as we just talked about this. There's my people. And, you're doing great. Um, and I would agree with everything that you've said. It's been, you know, it, it, the work is hard, but the work is good. And we've been. Oh, Shelly lost you. Shell, are you there? Can you hear me now? Yes, we missed. It's like you muted partway through there. That was weird. <laughs> yeah, I my internet came up unstable, so I'm not sure. Um, but I was just saying that it's been really awesome to see the growth. The work is hard, but it's really good, important work. And even talking to students um, outside of the data, it's just been really amazing to hear, you know, their excitement with reading. Oh, it happened again, Shell. Um, so we didn't want to teach you Scarborough's Rope. Uh, we wanted to take Scarborough's Rope and talk about it from the perspective of, okay, we know all of what has to go into our system to create, to make sure that our students become proficient readers. So how do we do that as a system? And obviously if you're from Pennsylvania, a lot of these are very familiar to you because many of these come from Patton's MTSS resources and their plate. So we tried to kind of look at as a team, what are these skills that are kind of foundational to our work? And then um, also then how can we make sure that we have those, those foundational skills in place, but then what do we need to do in addition to that? So what are the most essential pieces? And then how do we kind of continue to grow that forward? So we wanted to talk to you about all of the changes we've made and the work that we've been doing through each of these strands.
Raquel, would you mind jumping in on this leadership slide? Absolutely. And that's really what it began with. It began with leadership. Um, the first thing that we had to do was find our tribe and our expert friends. A lot of them are in our own backyard. Some of them are on the call tonight. Um, so, you know, we brought attention to our problem and our problem was that we were not growing our students. Um, we had some school board presentations where we talked about our data. Uh, it was not looking good. And so, you know, that really just kind of made us realize we, we've got to do something different. We, we have to figure this out. Um, and so we started some collaboration with expert friends. Um, those included um, our, our local um, intermediate unit, uh, Aaron uh, 28. And we started talking with um, some leadership at uh, Patton. Um, we started meeting as an administrative team. Every other Thursday, we would meet for a leadership and literacy meeting just to kind of talk through what we could do. Um, we did an audit of our resources. Uh, Pam Kastner was kind enough to come and help us work through that scenario. Um, we figured out what we had as far as, you know, what was being effective, what wasn't effective. And uh, then a, another one of uh, Mike Vukovic's famous quotes, go slow to go fast. Um, but, you know, there was definitely, um, I think that we were feeling like we cannot fail our children. We have to set some goals. We have to get a plan in place. And then we started building capacity. And I was going to add to what Kelly said, fierce conversations. Um, because I think back on our journey and when we all came together and you're working to get everyone on the same track and moving in the same direction and each of us coming in different roles, it was, there were some fierce conversations, but I also think that we were, um, we've grown with, from that. And I think we've grown from having honest conversations about which direction we should head and, and those kinds of things. So leadership has been absolutely critical. And the first year that we implemented, and even last year, was it, it was last year that we started the, the biweekly meetings. Yeah. And that was something that I think we discovered. We were missing that piece of getting us all together, kind of distraction-free. Let's, where are we at? What do we need to do? Because we were all, I think, tackling things, but maybe not in as much of a streamlined way. So um, leadership is so, so key. Yeah, we, we, we just weren't being strategic yet. Um, so we had some growing pains. And, you know, I think it's also important for everybody to know that our team, as it, we're relatively new, um, we've only been together for three years now. And in the beginning, um, we were speaking the same language, but we weren't using the same vocabulary. And so uh, it, it took us a while to, to really learn how to effectively communicate with one another too, I think. I agree. Kel, do you want to talk about this with some of the curricular changes we made? Uh, sure. You know, this is just a tool that um, you can find at the Reading League, another just wonderful resource. Um, and if you go through it, it just kind of talks about what to look for in your programming. It gives you green flags. It gives you red, gives you red flags. And when I talked about that audit, that's basically what we did. We went through, we audited our resources. We um, determined, um, you know, what was good, what wasn't so good, what we didn't have in place at all. One of the things we didn't have in place at all, for instance, was phonics. Pretty key, important uh, part of teaching a child to learn to read. Um, uh, we had the fluency, but, um, you know, again, background knowledge and vocabulary was also lacking. And so for that reason, um, after I think only two years of implementing Benchmark Advanced, uh, we uh, went uh, forward with core knowledge language arts, CKLA. And so um, we felt that that would be a much better resource to be using to build background knowledge, to make the playing field um, equal and to start building vocabulary because that was really lacking. Um, with, with phonics, we went with Wilson Foundations and then we also added um, Hegarty. Um, on onto um, the plates. And uh, it, it's been a really good mix of resources. Um, and I think that Ange will talk a little bit more about some of the other things that we're doing. But again, if you haven't started this yet, this is a really, really um, great starting point using this tool and just kind of figuring out what you have in place and what you need. 
And I think it helps your team stay focused on those essential pieces because I think that that was a large part of our journey is, you know, the, we had so I am a school psych, well, so, what's that? We just had so many moving parts. Right. Well, and I was going to say too, like from the perspective of a school psychologist, I, my training is different. And so I had kind of had a clean slate when it came to um, all of our trainings, like be a good consumer of research, know how to interpret evidence and to apply it in the educational setting. And I'm thinking, well, doesn't everybody just do that? And so I feel like something like this um, will help your team stay focused in making a selection that fits the needs related to the science of reading. And that was kind of the first part. That was the biggest shift. It was like, who all the resources. Um, this, and I should have hyperlinked it. It's not, I just screenshotted this, but this is on the patent website. And this is one of the most valuable tools that I feel like our leadership team has found. So what we did is each of us independently completed it and we rated each of them independently. And then we came together as a team to see where we fell so that we could decide what did we need to focus on? because it seemed like we were all kind of focusing on different things. And what this drew us back to is our tier one still wasn't fully stable. So we were like, we need to go back to tier one and make sure that we are supporting that, supporting the professional development, supporting the coaching. Um, But this was a fabulous tool for just kind of figuring out where are we at and where do we want to go next? And, And we just had a conversation today. We have these big those real large expensive post-it boards in the director of ed's office. There's two of them and actually three. And today we just said, Hey, we can take these down and condense them and make a new one because we've done so many things. And this is one of the the tools that I would say helped us the most. And I would agree with that completely. We, um, I know Angie and I have gone back to it quite a few times and just said, okay, oh my goodness. Oh, Shell, it did it again. I wonder if you turn your camera off, if that would help. We love to see your face, but I wonder if that's causing some problems. All right. right. Um, Shell, do you want to try again? Sure. I'm going to turn my camera off and keep it off, I think. Um, I was just saying that that tool is so valuable. We've gone back to it quite a few times. And when you're living in it, the day-to-day in the middle of it, sometimes you lose sight of all of the things that have been accomplished. And so going back to that is like an anchor to help you see where you've grown and where you still need to do more work. Yeah. And I would, oh, sorry, Kel, go ahead. I was just going to say, I think um, as our team completed that tool, it was very interesting to me to see that um, it was pretty consistent. We all were recognizing um, where our own gaps were and what we needed to do to move forward. So um, there was a lot of consistency when we filled that out. Yeah. And so I have on here, so we wanted, and this is Dr. Pam Kastner's. I love when she says knowledge time times practice. Like we have to make sure we're building all of those things as we're building complex change. And we know that programs don't teach, teachers do. And when we first started on this initiative and foundations was new to the district and I was working with my colleague and It was kind of like, I don't understand why there feels like there's some angst around this. But then I realized you have to know the English language and phonics skills and patterns to such a deep level to teach it well. And all of our teachers I discovered too, want to do an exceptional job, which is what I love about them so much. So they were worried they were not going to do it the right way. So that, that, and I can understand that apprehension now looking back at how much I've grown in my knowledge. So I have the, the change curve in there um, because I feel like this is all of kind of what we've gone through, even as our leadership team, there was just, there was so much, I think we were probably closer on the upswing, but it's been cool to see how all of the groups that we've been working with and the teams are on this upward trend now with digging into the data. And um, some of the things that we have listed here about aligning professional development. So as we decided that we wanted to focus on tier one, um, Mr. Vukovic didn't talk about CHAL, but he has CIAO, curriculum, instruction, assessment, and operation. And so 
that kind of became our focus of tier one, but it can matriculate through all the tiers. And we decided that that's how we were going to align our professional development. And so um, we have done some letters professional development, but we were like that coaching that along the way, but then also aligning all of what we're supporting our teachers in doing by allowing them to join PLCs that fit what they felt their needs were related to child. So if they felt um, I'm supporting a science of reading PLC, um, we have support from our IU looking at just kind of dabbling with understanding ECRI and instructional routines, because that feels funny sometimes I think when you're, but it's so good and predictable for kids. And then we have um, Shelly and April who are doing a data-driven decision-making PLC. So we're really trying to help teachers build their capacity and their understanding in the skill areas they feel that they need. And then as a team, we've also tried to figure out like how can we best support our teachers? And um, so part of that has come through the data teaming process. So we will be like, oh, coaching makes sense for this team or this teacher about peer, peer assisted learning strategies because that's the focus of their win group or um, 20 minute takeaways. So we've also discovered, and Mr. Vukovic has the best sayings ever, but he says, we want volunteers, not hostages. And so that's kind of been my mantra about the 20 minute takeaways. So I will like offer or our team will offer like, hey, today we're going to talk about how to dig into your Acadians data and decide if you need more information or how to understand your classroom data. And then individuals can choose if they'd like to come. And that has been so beneficial for us because it's allowed us to build relationships. And I think it's difficult. And we do have teacher leaders as well. Um, but I think for, as a school psychologists, also shifting to a comprehensive school psych model, it's like you're a school psychologist. What do you know about this? And so um, that was something that was a difficult shift. So it allowed us to build trust and capacity. And I see um, Aaron asking when we offer the 20 minute takeaways. That's a great question. We have an awesome schedule that allows for about 30 to 35 minutes in the morning or the afternoon. And so it's kind of, build around when we don't have data team meetings, that's when those are offered. And it's part of the teacher day and it's not allocated to anything other than, um, it's kind of like free game, right, Cal? Mm -hmm. Yes. <clears throat> Shell, anything else you'd add? No, I think that you're doing a nice job. I think, um, you know, just us having everything lined up has been really, um, really awesome. And I know I came in Kind of the second year of everything being implemented and so it's been fun to see how the parts and pieces have worked together and we've really been trying to build a lot of capacity through the coaching because you know it is so important to start to you know be able to support people in the journey we had all new curriculum and that's a lot i was in a classroom before i became a school psychologist and that shift is really hard so I think that being able to offer all of these supports has been really cool and really nice to see people reaching out for some of those supports as well. And that's increased over time, which is huge for us. <laughs> I think that part of the coaching model too is that, you know, you have to admit that you need some help or maybe um, you're not quote unquote doing it right or just that feeling of, you know, am I okay? And, and I think that that took a little bit of time for people to get um, to the point where they were willing to reach out. But it's happening. It is happening. That's another one of the sayings. It's happening. Um, so the complex change chart is something else that I wanted to, I felt like has been a huge asset to our team. And I'll let Kelly and Shelly share their experience here in a little bit. But when you come into this, and I've said this from the start, I'm okay not being liked as long as I know the decisions that I'm making are for the benefit of the children. And when I say not being liked, it's not like I'm saying that I work with a bunch of people who don't, who aren't kind, that's not it. But here comes a new person that you don't have rapport with prior to all these changes. And someone made the comment to me, like, they brought you here because we're broken and we can't do things right. And it's like, that's not it at all. We're looking at it from a systems level and this chart was so helpful because when you're going through the changes, it's like, it's hard not to take it personally. Sometimes when you know, your heart's in the right place and you're really 
wanting to make gains and build relationships. And it's, it seems so clear to you, but it's also hard whenever you having those fierce conversations to not be like, man, this is really rough. And so when we look at this chart, it has really helped us say like, oh, well, no wonder they're anxious. So let's use the example of digging into foundations. There's some anxiety around foundations. So then we go back and we're like skills. We need to make sure that they are comfortable explaining the rules. And I was in a second grade classroom and God bless this wonderful teacher. She's presenting and we have school board members there and we had, um, administration there. And she's talking, she was running through an instructional routine and, um, the vowel team, it was, the word was wind, but she was highlighting the vowel sounds first and she got to wind and she goes, and the kid said, eh, and then she get, and then somebody's like, but it could say I, and she's like, okay, so sometimes we need to phone a friend. And so it was like a cool experience because she felt comfortable in that moment, but that goes back to, there's so much you need to know because all those layers of language that are highlighted in letters, every single module is so critical because you have to run through all of those um, to be able to explain those rules. And kids, it's so cool. Cause like Shelly said, kids are asking questions about words and they wanna know they're becoming word nerds like us, which is really cool. Um, but Kelly and Shell, I'll let you share your experience with this. Yeah, so um, like Ange said, we've had a lot of fierce conversations and there's an emotion around any time that there's change. You know, people hate change, but they don't wanna stay where they are. So we're going into meetings and, you know, we're leaving these meetings and we're like, man, what, what just happened? <laughs> like that meeting was going so well. And then it like went off the rails and, you know, why are we seeing this? So, you know, Kelly and I were on the phone and, and, you know, part of this too, is I started in the middle of COVID. So building those relationships is difficult. So I'm like, you know, is this a normal dynamic or is this me or, you know, what's going on? So we're on the phone and, you know, we're like, let's look at the complex change chart. And so we start going through it with, um, you know, the different things that had come up and why is this happening? And we're going back and forth, you know. We lost her again. So we're going back and forth and, you know, one of us thought it was anxiety. One of us thought it was confusion, you know, but we, we really started to analyze it. What it came down to is Identify that- the need and we needed skills. Mm -hmm. Shell, I'm Shell, so you jump, you jumped out, Shell, and then Kel jumped back in. Yeah, you keep you keep cutting in and out a little bit, but um, you know we are such nerds. After these meetings, we actually pull out our complex change chart and try to sometimes analyze what could have gone on. And really, and one of them, it was resources. Um, there was frustration because we were lacking some of the resources. And so once we figured that out, we were able to get things ordered and. Um, you know, take away the frustration. Um, early on, what we realized was that there was just some confusion. When you look at confusion, well, that goes back to the vision, just not having a clear understanding. And that falls back on me. I need to be a better communicator. Um, and, and so just, I, I, I really recommend using this complex change chart um, when you're just trying to figure out, you know, what needs to happen to make everybody feel supported and want to move forward. This has been really, really beneficial for our team to use. And Kel, I also think about our leadership team and how we drafted a vision together at one of our meetings, because we realized that that's what we were missing as a leadership team. Like we felt like we knew what our goal was, but then we really needed to tighten that up and be more explicit with what that looked like. Um, there was a question in the chat that I didn't get to answer from Heather. So have you found the more efficient your use of assessment data has become the more time you have in the day to support teachers? And I feel like we've, um, so it's nice because there's a team of three of us and we also have really great reading specialists that teachers um, will definitely approach to get some coaching from too. I would say that we kind of have to be very creative still with our schedules because our system isn't steady enough quite yet that our referrals are down for evaluations for special education. We're getting better. Um, so we just had to be a little bit strategic with our planning. And so when we have coaching, we have a coaching request form. So the teachers will fill out the coaching request form and it comes to all three of us. And then April Shelley and I will be like, okay, who wants to take this one? Who's available? And then we 
tag team it. And we tell teachers, like when you submit it, you'll get back, we'll get back to you in 48 hours. And then um, that gives teachers an opportunity to kind of just know that somebody's coming. <laughs> um, so that's a good question. We definitely have to get creative sometimes. We're good to move on. Yep. So um, huge shout out to Bighorn Elementary because I, so this was something this is, and what was so crazy is that hit, that came out and Mike and Mr. Vukovic and I had had many conversations and he kept saying like, we need to communicate. We need to communicate. We need to communicate. And my brain was having such a hard time trying to figure out like, what kind of structure can we put to this that makes the most sense? Um, and so this is where I like the talking points, it was so helpful to, to kind of organize it this way. Um, and this is just the front cover of, I think, a seven or eight page document that outlines the changes that we made because there was a lot of this, there was, it was hard to relinquish the level text and the small groups and the way that felt, um, I think was difficult. And again, it was hard for, for me to understand because my role was a little bit different, but also knowing the importance of shifting the focus away from the level text. And so we felt like this was a way to summarize our efforts, um, to help families understand, to help um, community members understand our school board, all of the things. Um, so that's where this originated from because we felt like it was so important for us to share our vision um, with our community and just continue to build that outreach with them. And I just see Heather again, Bighorn is influencing and leading meaningful change here in Wyoming, which is so awesome. And I admire them tremendously because it was very well done. And so it was a great model for many of us who are kind of like, again, where do we start? Um, and that's where I know we've talked a lot about the kinds of things we've been doing and what we've been focusing on. And when we looked at Patton's plate um, and MTSS, we're like high quality core instruction, high quality core instruction. Like it was kept jumping out at us. And so when we were looking at all of these different areas and what we had and what we were doing, we realized that again, not the programs are not teaching, it's our teachers. So we really had to look at bridging research to practice and spiraling that through um, all of the areas that teachers, all of the different programs teachers were using to help us teach reading. Because our plan was originally um, foundations integrity and keep benchmark to hit the vocabulary and comprehension piece. But if we're talking about equitable outcomes for all, we're not providing the same content, knowledge, vocabulary to all students. So we were like, how can we make sure that we're providing this rich information for students? Um, and that's how CKLA entered the picture. I love seeing kids excited about CKLA. And sometimes it's part of a conversation where, where like, if I got to do lunch duty last week and it was the highlight of my week. And it's like so cool when you're like, hey, what are you learning about in CKLA? And the kids have so much to share and they'll be like, we're learning about this, but this is my favorite. So that's been really fun to see. But I would say that something our team has focused on a lot is helping to support the teachers. And again, trying to take the onus off of them feeling like it's us fixing them. And I'm like, listen, part of our job, how can you be a teacher doing all the things that teachers are doing? And then add into that, like, look at the research. What does the research tell you? How much knowledge do you have of statistics and all of those things? So we've just been trying to really bridge that gap to make sure that the work we're doing around tier one is aligning with evidence-based practices. School psychologists love this slide. I don't know if, if Shelly Shelley was saying she was trying to join from her iPad. Kel, do you wanna take this one or do you want me to jump in on this one? No, I, I can talk a little bit about this because again, this was a really major shift in our school culture and climate. Um, when I first came on board, we were having what they call data team meetings. Um, and they were happening once a month with each grade level, but it was really just a time that <laughs> we were talking about individual children. And sometimes those conversations spiraled into, you know, what was going on at home. And just sometimes there just wasn't a focus on 
the child and what the child needed and the data. And so we really um, shifted what our data team meetings look like and started to focus more on tier one because tier one um, is not strong enough yet. And so rather than talking about individual students, we started talking about our practices. And so um, with that shift, all decisions that we're, we're making are based on data. Um, we learned that knowledge and skill building was essential. Um, in developing the teaming structures, um, you know, last year was tough. We were online, um, we were in person, uh, but all of our meetings had to be um, virtual. So we were doing a lot of Google Meets and we had our beginning year data team meeting and, you know, all the reading that I was doing and the new learning that I was doing, I knew that we needed to keep moving on. And so I reached out to Shelly, who's my school psych that I primarily work with. And I said, you know, I, I think that we need to start having um, more meetings to really make sure that we're looking at the data, using the data and talking about how to um, make some different changes in their practices. And she said, oh man, I don't know. Do we want to do it this year? And I said, well, all we can do is try. And it's probably the best thing that we, we could have done. Um, having biweekly team meetings, um, we actually use gradual release. So at first I was facilitating with Shelly and then we um, eventually released it to teachers. So they're facilitating their own meetings now and um, talking about the data, not talking about individual children so much. Um, and it, it's just been a really um, neat transformation. And I'm, I'm just so proud of, of my school and our staff. Um, and then within that, we plan the coaching and um, how to support teachers. Um, we're no longer going, you know, off of our guts. Well, my gut tells me that maybe, um, you know, this child needs extra help. Well, is it your gut or is it the data? So we're able to, again, just go back and look at what we've done. And then, um, Angie, I think you put in the Oregon RTI, and it really is a good resource. Um, that would be something great that you could Google um, if you wanted to take a look at, you know, um, just a really great playbook. It's fabulous. And I like the examples and I like how there's completed versions and training materials. And it just really helps you think forward for what you kind of want all of it to look like. And I also think kind of like Kelly said too, that that circle of influence um, and what do we have control over? Because we know that the circle's this big, but we really only have control over a smaller part of it. And I think that it has really um, allowed us to hone in on what specifically we actually can influence. And I think one of the best places that we started, which was a huge shift, was like, we're not talking about grade levels of students with names. We're just talking about what's going well in tier one and what do we need to work on? Um, question about what monitoring system you use. We are using a cadence for a universal screener. And then, um, and we have a slide coming. I actually think it's the next slide, Cal, if you want to go to it. Um, these are the assessments that we use most often. So we use um, the universal screening as a cadence. And then we also give all students K to five, the spelling inventory, because we feel like it can give us some great insight into, you know, their phonic skills, but also the spelling, because we know the encoding is much more difficult than the decoding, but it can also allow us to say like, hmm, like look at the kinds of errors this student made. And then from there, we can give other diagnostics as needed. So we use the past, the core phonics survey, and then we were fortunate to be a part of the dyslexia pilot. And our reading specialists have really embraced using the dyslexia screener for Apple Group. Fidelity of implementation might be one of the more challenging parts that I think we've tackled as a team as far as, you know, what does this look like and how do we address this piece where it doesn't feel uncomfortable for teachers, um, which again goes back to under, and it's again, just teaching and the skills and the knowledge. Uh, when I think about fidelity, if someone was also coming to me to do that check, it would kind of feel a little weird at first, but the idea being, if are we implementing it with fidelity? Because then that's the piece that we know if we're not hitting tier one to 80% and what does our fidelity information tell us? Like, are we on with our pacing? Um, are there are there pieces that maybe aren't being hit every single time? Like, what does that look like? And so we continue to build this out. And one of our goals is to communicate 
with teachers around this topic and look at the possibility of self checks of fidelity where we're not collecting individual teacher information. So we would be able to know like by grade level, just a little bit of a gauge. And I know when you talk about self assessment, it's like, well, people could lie, but I also think even though they could be not honest, um, it's going to make you think about it. I think a little more critically, like it's coming to the forefront again. And so again, this is just kind of a bit of our, um, conversation around fidelity and something we want to get a bit better at, a bit better at as a team. Yeah. And can you tell me what the hero memo padlet is? Oh, that's Kelly's. We'll let her share. Yeah. I'm really curious about what that is. Yeah. That sounds pretty awesome. <laughs> well, Pam, that was, uh, I took, I took a, a note from your playbook. Um, you had been sharing the padlets and the, and the wakelets um, on, you know, social media. And so we're the Ben Franklin heroes. Uh, my Monday morning memo has really evolved. Um, and so I try to present some teaching and learning expectations. And so I have um, just different articles teachers can um, read if they have time, very short videos to watch. That's sometimes a little bit easier podcasts to listen to on their way in. Again, just really being a good listener, um, trying to figure out what some of the needs are during our biweekly grade level team meetings, and then just um, trying to find some things that would help. And then I took all the information and put it onto a Padlet so that um, if they need to go back and access it, they didn't have to try to go back into the Monday morning memo, um, just all the teaching resources are there. And then we also have um, teaching and learning celebrations. Um, and we just kind of highlight some of the great things that are happening. That was the last thing I was going to add is I love when I get to the glow section. <sighs> and I would just add too that um, it's been really helpful coaching wise as well to see what has been shared. And then we're able to support that through the coaching. And I know Kelly had shared um, something for blending sounds with matchbox cars and like you walk into the kindergarten classroom and you see the teachers doing it and you see the kids getting excited about reading. And so those, those things that Kelly has shared have been so helpful for many reasons. Yeah. So thanks for that inspiration, Pam. Appreciate it very much. <laughs> and we've touched upon this, I think kind of throughout the course of our conversation tonight, um, just about our support and coaching, because I, it's definitely impossible to have a lot of this stick if it's just a spray and pray. And the more that we can continue to have conversations, we're building trust, we're getting teachers confident in skills that maybe they're not feeling confident in. And um, those coaching request forms are great. And I think another part that our team would like to get to is more of that systematic coaching where we're kind of making sure that we're all kind of, yes, teachers can request coaching, but are we needing to streamline our coaching to make sure, which is where we felt like those self-assessments would come in as being helpful. So if there's a particular area that a whole grade level may be struggling with, we can tackle that from a systemic perspective. And if I could just add in, um, you know, as principal of the building, I need to try to also figure out how I can support throughout the school day. So trying to, um, if the teachers want to go in or have a conversation with Shelly, I'll go in and, you know, read a story or teach the lesson that was going to be taught. If I can, um, you know, free up some time in my day also. So just trying to be supportive, to give them that time with the coaches. Um, you know, when they reach out to the coaches, Shelly doesn't share with me who's reached out to her. Um, you know, I, I just, I, I try to stay hands off, but yet if they need me, I'll go in and um, at least try to provide some coverage. So you know how hard that is right now with subs and everything. <laughs> Um, so the last piece is more of our response to intervention, which we're, I think we're pretty much ready to apply for. Um, so we talked a lot about tier one, but we also have a schedule that allows for win, which is what I need. And that's for everyone. And it's flexible groupings based on our data. So we have targeted skill groups during that time. And then our reading specialists opposite that time, they work to provide what we are calling double dips. So students receive core instruction plus win, plus then a double dip um, if it's needed. And that flexible grouping has been really beneficial for us to be able to look at 
I say how slow is slow and how low is low. And those pathways of pathways of progress are tremendously helpful. And it's so awesome when you go in and you check something out and you're like, oh my gosh, like, look at this pathway. And um, the other key piece of that though, I do think is that consistent progress monitoring. So within our system, students who are below benchmark are progress monitored every 10 instructional days and students who are well below benchmark are monitored every five instructional days. So then we can make good decisions as a team when we come together to say like, but their pathway is showing well above typical progress. Like we need to keep this train moving and revisit it again. And we see that with a lot of kids. And if I could just jump in and say something I felt this year that's been really beneficial is we've been able to train all of our teachers to be able to progress monitor. So it's not just, you know, your reading specialist trying to get to all of the students to monitor. We have all teachers trained. So we're able to even monitor, you know, if we have a student that scored proficient or, you know, above the benchmark at benchmarking time, but then we have a concern, the teachers can monitor just as much as our title teachers have been. So this is just the picture of how everything comes together. We have SEL on the other side because we have um, a lot of that also happening as part of our MTSS framework. So this just kind of explains how our focus is to provide this continuum of time, intensity, and data across the tiers. And we definitely still have work to do. I, I, and I know we can't just blame everything on the pandemic and that's not what I'm trying to, to do, but I just feel like we were like moving along so, so well. And then it was like, but I'm, I mean, I'm still so proud of our team because we've done so much in spite of all the things. And so we've been able to move forward. And when we've looked at our data, we've tried to look kind of longitudinally at how much learning loss did we have. And I will say we've been able to at least hold the line or grow the ones that tended to have the greatest learning loss, which were the K-1 students. Um, and then it's been really cool because our fifth grade group would have been not a part of any of the new changes. And that group is just remained flatlined with the bench, with the composite store. We use the composite because if I did every subject, it'd make me crazy, but they pretty much flatlined. And then you look at the other ones who they made a little dip. And then you start to see this uptick. And it's so cool because every other group has had an uptick. And students in fourth grade only had three, nine weeks of foundations in second grade. And so it's been really cool to see because I can't remember if it was kindergarten or first, there was a drastic dip, but then a real quick spike back up. And I wish I would have thought to include that slide. I can send that to you later, Pam, so that you can add that if you'd like. Um, and again, like we, we recognize that we're still working to that 80%. And we also recognize how young we really are in this whole process. And we're doing K to five. So it's not even as though we started just K one. And so we really expanded it because like Mike says, we're here to make sure that um, we, like, it's so hard to say, like, we're just starting here when you know that the need's so much greater. And so we've just done the best that we can to expand it out as quickly and carefully as we can. I know we're running short on time. We're almost done with what we had prepared for you. Um, I know this quote has been talked about often and we talk about this and because I feel the same way. I mean, there's so much that I did as a school psychologist and I'm like, oh my gosh, I can't believe how much more, how much better I can do just knowing what I know in making intervention plans for students or designing assessment plans to get us the right information. And so I fully believe this because now it's just allowed all of us to do better. And so thank you. Thank you so much, the whole team, for your fantastic presentation tonight. Uh, we are just um, overwhelmed by what you've taken on in this short amount of time, plus the pandemic. And so we just want to applaud you for continuing with your change efforts. And it's a very difficult task. And normal situations, um, but that you kept uh, your, your sights set on what your vision was and really guided your process through the MTSS framework. I think that's a huge takeaway for me um, that I'm hoping other teams hear that you use that to guide your process. Um, and that quickly and carefully, right? We're trying to impact students as quickly as possible, but 
also um, take care to not have false starts um, because those are really um, challenging. So we all are um, saying thank you so much for all the time and effort that you put into tonight's presentation and congratulations on your journey and your progress that you've already made. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, it's great to see you too, nice and <laughs> Yeah, nice to see the thanks in the chat there too. I hope that you're all seeing that. And would like to echo Aaron's statements, but also to again point out um, how important leadership is to sustainable change and equitable outcomes for kids. Of course, teachers are absolutely essential and the, the biggest impact um, on student learning. But boy, if we want um, practices to sustain um, and we want equity for all kids, it's leadership, leadership, leadership. Uh, we've learned that lesson over and over and over again. So I want to thank you all for your leadership and uh, for engaging in, as you said, that hard work but making such a difference. Um, I'll check to see if there are any questions. And then before we close up, Don um, is going to share uh, an update about our book study coming up. Sure, I'd like to echo, first of all, what Pam and Erin shared. Thank you so much for sharing your extraordinary work. We're honored that you took the time tonight to be a lighthouse for us across mm -hmm. the nation. I did share in chat, we have a wonderful book study coming up with Jan Hasbrook, as well as Daryl Mickle co-authors of Student Focus Coaching. That book study will be in April and the link is in the chat. So please join us. And I also placed in the chat, uh, AIM Institute is having its 10th annual Research to Practice Symposium. It is free, free, free. So I know all you are all very busy people, but if you sign up ahead of time, if you register, we'll send you the recording. So we would love to have you join us. It's available both in person as well as virtual. And again, thank you to our Indiana team and thank you to all of our members who joined us this evening. And join us uh, again one month actually from today, March 16th, Centennial School District. And Don, maybe give a quick uh, shout out to Centennial with Ernie Ortiz. They will be joining us to share their journey in the science of reading. So Don, do you want to just share a little brief? Uh, sure. About Centennial? Uh, Centennial School District with Ernie Ortiz will be speaking and Anthony Gabriel, uh, their assistant superintendent, will be presenting on their journey, which has been a three-year journey in advancing the science of reading in their school district and have done some really uh, exceptional work and we're excited to showcase them next month and again thank you to each of you. And all the recordings from the RPA Proud Showcase are on the Wakelet. This recording will be added as well as uh, the PDF of this presentation as well as other resources that were shared and again thank you so very very much to the team at Indiana Area School District and to all of you for joining us this evening.